Hey, you're looking nice today. It's so good to see you as always. Today we're gonna talk about City Council's March 4th meeting. Exciting stuff, right? Well, we've got important things to talk about like East Tampa CRA and the continued negligence of the issues in East Tampa. We'll also talk about more usage of policing and the advancement of the war on drugs right here at home. And we'll have an interesting debate about Broadway. <laughs> Stick with us, we sit through the meetings so you don't have to. back. It's me, Megan She, Her, Hers with Tampa Bay Activist Network. This is episode five of City Council Watch. Can you believe it's been five episodes already? I'm overjoyed to say the least. This is because of the hardworking grassroots team on the screen, behind the scenes, and of course, because of viewers just like you who make this work possible and so important. My name is Tori with the Black Collective Movement, She, Her, Hers, and we're your hosts for City Council Watch. Now, I know I don't need to remind you all, but just in case, make sure that you subscribe, hit that notification bell for important reminders, and stay engaged. Listen, if we could, we would have this type of program for every government entity in the area. School board watch, county commission watch, citizen review board watch. Yeah, those need to happen. But although we don't have the capacity to manage that, we do occasionally have an opportunity to report on things that happen in other meetings. Two of the People Safety Coalition founding members, Erdesha and Angel, attended an East Tampa Community Advisory Committee, or CAC meeting, on Tuesday, March 2nd. The committees are composed of community members elected to represent a certain area and the various neighborhood associations. We're still learning all of the mechanics of everything, but we wanted to take a moment to report back on some of the things happening in East Tampa. Now, I was just recently at the East Tampa Community Advisory Committee, and I want to tell you how disappointed I am in this city council. There were so many technological errors, it's unacceptable. People could not even have their voices heard to participate in the community. And this advisory committee is working so hard to fight for East Tampa. East Tampa is the most vibrant and beautiful part of Tampa. Why is East Tampa always being neglected? It's pretty wild that there were so many technological issues. This city has millions upon millions of dollars in their budget, but yet, the East Tampa CAC meetings are fighting for decent audio and working equipment. But that's not the only thing they have to fight for. Exactly. Miss Yvette Lewis, who is the president of the local branch of the NAACP and a CAC member, was not pleased when representatives from the city of Tampa, Parks and Recreation came to the CAC meeting to talk about all the money being invested into the rec center. While far too many people in East Tampa can't find quality housing, jobs, transportation, or overcome the food desert. Miss Connie Burton, the CAC chair, was clear. The rec center is important and East Tampa wants to see it thrive. But it'd be like, as she says, having the dessert without the main dish. Miss Connie reminded the city representatives that the people of East Tampa know what they need. They don't need the city to come in and tell them. They need the city to come in and listen and then take action. What's also important is that the people of East Tampa said in their public comments, defund the police and refund the community. The community is organized and ready to go. Mayor Castor may have said it was a small fringe of quote, loud voices calling for it last year. But what she means by that is, hey, it's just those people in that neighborhood we don't care about. Mayor, there is more to the city than just South Tampa. East Tampa, the People Safety Coalition hears you. We want to organize with you and support the amazing work your community leaders have been doing for years. If you're watching this, consider joining us at the People's Safety Coalition. Absolutely, and your ideas are crucial to our work around influencing the city's budget and refunding the community. If you can, please take a few moments to take our budget survey and pass it along to all of your neighbors. Once the pandemic settles, we'll be out in the community passing out information, but for now, we have to stay digital. Now, this is an important segue into item number 41 on the March 4th agenda. Item number 41 was the second hearing for the adoption of an ordinance called the Tampa Comprehensive Plan pertaining to land usage. Sounds pretty boring, right? Absolutely. Here's why it's important. The city council was voting on adopting the language to include this provision. Modifying policy language, directing the Tampa Police Department to focus on neighborhood crime and drug activity. <sighs> so you're telling me that right now our city council leaders voted in favor of directing more police 
into neighborhoods for drug activity. Now, in 2021, I would have thought we have learned something, but it seems as though we have learned nothing from the protests that occurred last year. The fact is, policing's not going to solve the problems, and it's not designed to. This is why refunding the community is so critical. The good news is, they did strike through some very, very problematic objectives in this plan. There was going to be language in there directing policing to target specific areas and even to work with code enforcement to identify crack houses and gangs. In 2021, when we are facing a housing crisis, there are people still trying to go into low income, black and brown communities and saying things like crack houses. They're never worried about the quote unquote cocaine houses in Bay Shore. Yeah, South Tampa, I'm looking at you, we know. But yeah, I agree. I'm happy they struck out the obvious dog whistle language, but sadly the new version they voted on still contains punitive language that we know will target low income, black and brown communities in Tampa. Right, the new language is definitely softer, but still calls for policing crime and drug neighborhoods. And by now, we all know what that means. That's not what the people need. Evidence overwhelmingly shows that policing does not curb drug addiction. And addiction is a serious problem in low income, marginalized communities and or LGBTQ communities. But not because people in these communities are bad people or weak people, but because of systemic injustices people in these communities face. The war on drugs escalated in the 1980s and since then has cost us lives, largely black lives and devastated gay, queer and trans communities. According to Drug Sense, over 300,000 US residents have been arrested this year alone for drug related offenses and 156,000 individuals were specifically arrested for cannabis. In 2021, so far, over $7 billion has been spent on this war, according to Drug Sense. It is only the beginning of March, and this is the direction we're going in. And although evidence has shown white communities actually participate in more drug usage, on average, than black communities, that isn't reflected in arrest records. This is one reason why we have such a disparity between the races in our prison system. With those stark numbers, we can tell plainly that this drug war isn't solving the drug problem. Of course, that's not what it's ever been in intended to do. If city council wants to actually solve the drug crisis for everyone, not just the opioid crisis in white communities, then they need to take a different approach. They could advocate for walk-in judgment-free addiction, harm reduction, and recovery centers in our neighborhoods. They could look at needle exchange programs. Mayor Castor could give a directive to not perform any arrests, notice to appears, or citations for drug-related offenses. The cycle of arresting drug users has not made any of us any safer. In fact, only creates more barriers for these individuals to find work, housing in the future, making their problems even worse. On top of that, in Tampa, in 2014, 29-year-old Jason Westcott was murdered in Seminole Heights in his own home in front of his boyfriend due to a drug raid over less than $2 worth of cannabis. This was under Mayor Jane Castor's watch, and she obviously hasn't learned anything. This is why it's so critical that you get on the phone every week and have this dialogue with your city council member. Since all of them voted in favor of this language, except Citro, who was absent at the vote. We saw them give TPD an additional 13 million more dollars last year. Despite the cries of the people. So we know that they can fund harm reduction and non-punitive programs, but they need to have it demanded of them and often. It's my money and I need it now! Speaking of addiction, let's talk about Broadway. Wait, are you thinking of starring in Broadway? I mean, maybe, just a little. If you think I could win a Tony, just say that. Okay, wait, I'm getting distracted. No, I mean 4808 Broadway Avenue in East Tampa. Item number 47 came up to the table to bring up the subject of whether or not 4808 Broadway Ave should have the license to sell liquor and what we know as package stores. City Council had quite an important dialogue on the subject. Maybe we should start with Council Member Dingfelder. Here's my concern on this one. I went on one of those CRA walks last Saturday and we walked around the neighborhood with about 20 citizens. And when we did, you know, we had various issues, stormwater and potholes and this and that. But we came across one or two establishments that, that were packaged goods. They sold uh, beer and wine or liquor. And one of the comments I got from the neighborhood association was, you know, it's fine, they, they sell the packaged goods, but then people don't leave. 
They just hang around outside the stores, and it creates a community problem, a neighborhood problem. I can't speak to Councilman Goots as to why he voted against it. I'd be curious to why he did vote against it last time. Now, this is going to make a little bit more sense in a moment, but I want you to think about package stores, like the ones you see on Broadway, Nebraska, Florida, Hillsboro, and other poor areas of town. They're right there in the neighborhoods. It seems that there's some contention between city council members on this issue, and things got a little theatrical, to say the least. At any reference, at any time, in all my years of public service, I've never questioned any council member on the vote. I may not have agreed with it, but I don't ask a council member why they voted one way or the other. I think we ought to go forward, and my, my only opinion is I don't question the other six. If the other six question me, be a hold of yourself because I'll be ready. Councilman Dingfelder, your rebuttal. Mr. Marina, I hear what you're saying. Councilman Goods and I both voted against this last time. I'm not questioning and I would never question anybody. What I'm saying is, is it's helpful to have an understanding if somebody was on the fence, perhaps Councilman Goods, since this is his district and he grew up over in that neighborhood, perhaps he has a better insight in terms of why he voted against it. Well, it's getting a little tense in here, but the issue of package stores in black neighborhoods it's actually a lot larger of an issue than expressed. We'll go over that in a bit, but first let's hear how they voted. The question for item 47 was whether or not to approve a liquor license for a package store on 4808 East Broadway Avenue. For the record, Dingfelder and Goods voted no. Meanwhile, Miranda was absent at the vote. However, the others all voted yes, which means yet another package store in Port East Tampa has been approved. Councilmember Goods actually has a lot to say about that and it's important so let's hear it. I employ all of you to get a chance to go on the walking tours. I think that's why Mr. Dingfelder's mind is kind of waking up a little bit because what happens with these establishments? You can't find any of these other establishments in anybody else's community. They're not package stores inside of the community. And they bring on slum and blight, bring on drugs and alcohol. It's what I used to call back in the day when I would get up and go to work at 5 o'clock at the police department. I'd go to 29th and late and i say everybody's waiting for their medicine. Everyone's waiting for their medicine. They're waiting for the alcohol, the liquor to open up to feed their disease. And that's why I want to support these type of items because what it brings. It's a business, yes, but it's the wrong type of business inside of neighborhoods. What Council Member Goods says should resonate with all of you. He's not saying he opposes liquor stores, but in what other parts of Tampa do you commonly find package stores directly in neighborhoods? This is an example of systemic slumming of East Tampa. The city approves package stores like this while simultaneously approving more policing to deal with the problems these package stores cause. And this isn't just some made up East Tampa story. This has been studied. In August 2000, a report by Leviathan Wallace titled Health Risk and Inequitable Distribution of Liquor Stores in African American Neighborhoods shows that black neighborhoods across the U.S. have more package stores directly in their neighborhoods than any other population. This is by design and contributes to poor living conditions in these neighborhoods. A study by the Partnership to End Addiction in 2011 found a co-relationship between youth homicides and neighborhood package stores. Here's a direct quote from the study. The researchers also looked at violent crime statistics and census data for the city. They found violent crime rates were significantly higher in areas that had both higher densities of stores and retail stores with more cooler space devoted to single serve alcohol containers. Now this isn't us judging people who drink alcohol or even those with alcohol addiction. If you are struggling with addiction, please know that we love you, we see you, and you are not a bad person. But the fact is, these package stores perpetuate a cycle of addiction that can lead to poverty. Poverty leads to desperation, which is why robberies, assaults, and sadly, even homicides tend to happen in these areas. We're not opposed to liquor stores. It's just a problem that they're smack dab in the middle of an already suffering neighborhood. Wait, though we already saw how they voted, council member Vieira Maniscalco, Carlson, and Citro voted in favor of this liquor package store on Broadway. Now they have more to say about it. Two things. Uh, Marty suggested that we try to address the issue systemically. One would be getting together with the neighborhood associations and, and explain to them what competent substantial evidence is. The other thing, though, if you want to have a discussion, a workshop or something on, on creating a systemic solution, I, you know, I think we would all support that. Councilmember Carlson, who voted yes on the package store, 
does suggest a broader conversation around the larger systemic issues. I feel as though we the people have already been discussing it, and I for one am tired of talking about it. The solutions are right in front of us. It doesn't end there though. Our fearless leader, the progressive darling himself, Councilmember Vieira, who also voted yes, had some things to say, and I think it's worth a highlight. They often talk about the school to prison pipeline, then there's also the neighborhood to prison pipeline where a lot of our lower income communities get businesses in there that we know in one way or another are reasonably calculated to lead to, you know, negative and adverse life impacts. You know, when you talk about things and this is personal, it has absolutely no bearing on how we've ever voted, but when it comes to alcohol, you know, we know that alcohol, generally speaking, can have an adverse effect on people's lives. I've, I've never been much of a drinker. Maybe it's because I was raised in church, but that's just me, <laughs> you know, which is kind of funny. Council member Vieira plainly voted yes for this package store, but yet acknowledged with passion even the neighborhood to prison pipeline. He says on the record he understands the problems these types of package stores and neighborhoods cause, yet unapologetically voted in favor of it. This really doesn't sit well with me and makes me wonder why progressives are so supportive of him. His actions show us what he thinks of black people and the people of East Tampa. He wants the systemic injustices to continue and that is why he voted the way he voted. Call him and let him know about this trash vote and how you really feel. As a friend of Bill W and the lifestyle I led and, and was raised in, I understand your point about people needing their medicine. Councilman Dinkfelder, we have the perfect opportunity to speak together I believe we have something coming up concerning AB sales. I think this would be a perfect questions for us to raise during that conversation. Let's face it, gentlemen. If we would take out the waiver for distancing, half the bars in this city would be closed down. We have to realize that with some people, alcohol is a major problem. Let's look at the things that alcohol make other people do. Let's not even go into domestic violence. Let's not even go into robbery. Let's not even talk about assault and batteries. Let's not, let's take that out of the question. But we have the perfect opportunity coming up to discuss alcohol sales. And I think that's the time when we really need to take the deep dive and figure how this council is gonna help change those ordinances. Good old Citro, also naming his personal issues with alcohol addiction and the problems that can come along with addiction. It's wild. He also knows of these systemic issues, but yet voted yes for the package store. Instead, he seems adamant about wanting to talk about it later. When it comes to black neighborhoods, it's always later. This is one of the millions of reasons why Citro, Citro gotta, gotta go. go. Council member Citro and Dinkfelder brought up an important workshop I think all of us need to be at. April 22nd, they're going to be talking about alcohol and social distancing rules. I think that it's a good time to bring up all of these issues and elevate these points. Mark your calendars for April 22nd. We'll be sure to send out more information and bulletins so you know as much as possible to get prepared for this meeting. As city council continued, there were a few more ordinances and resolutions, but we don't have time to go into them all. We recommend you go online and check out the action summary. If you'd like to learn more about how to read city council agendas, our team is happy to meet with you. We aren't experts, we're learning as we go, but you can email us at this email I'm gonna put on the screen. Also, as a reminder, you can join us at the People's Safety Coalition and bring your ideas to us. We don't need you to have experience, just a passion for the people and for a better world. One of our membership ambassadors will meet with you and talk to you about how we can work together mutually. And there is no membership fees at all. We don't do that here, we don't. But be sure to hit that subscribe button and consider having city council watch parties. Bring over your best friends, your family, anyone else with masks, and social distancing and watch our episodes or you could even watch them at the same time over zoom have a little dialogue you know what i'm saying you may not agree with everything we say and that's okay but at least you'll be informed again my name is tori with the black elected movement of tampa and i am excited to see you all next time thanks for tuning in yes and i'm megan with tampa bay activist network signing out remember one voice can make a difference and it starts with yours subscribe and share Stay tuned for the Frontline Activist message. All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie, and we're here with the uh, Frontline Activist message. So my pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a Black male in his early 20s wearing a cream shirt, some glasses with Black frames, a Black beanie, and behind me is just a, a cream wooden wall. The panelists will introduce themselves. 
and then we'll go on and get started with today's segment. Hey y'all, my name is Diana. I am a white person. My pronouns are they, them, and behind me is a blue and brown geometric background. Hello, my name is Tatiana Morales. I am a black woman. Um, I have long curly black hair. My background is a big brown couch and white walls with tons of clutter and garbage. <laughs> All no, right. And my pronouns are she, her, hers. I feel like I didn't make that clear. <laughs> <laughs> you're fine, you're fine. So we're going to head and go and get started. So we're going to be talking about episode five of the whole segment for City Council Watch. And we're going to start with the neglect of East Tampa communities. Now, the Community Advisory Committee, the CAC, uh, lacks quality, quality audio and equipment for their meetings. Um, and then also the City of Tampa Parks and Recreation are still putting money into the community rec center, but not the community itself. As Ms. Connie Burton mentions, it's like having dessert without the main dish. So I want to ask you all, what are the thoughts on the technological issues within the CAC meetings and the city of Tampa's missing it mark by giving residents dessert without the main dish? So I think that especially with the pandemic and all the things that have come up so rapidly and so aggressively, it really showed the need for technological competence. Our city council has also complained about technological gaps and technological issues that have happened for their own meetings and their things like that. It just shows how our city needs to overall invest in not just the main stratosphere of the city council and the mayor's office. It needs to expand to all the parts of the city because we are a rather large city. North Tampa, South Tampa, Del Mabry, even the most unincorporated parts all need the support and all need these resources to move along because we do have very big issues and very big commitments that we need to serve our communities for. And I think overall having this investment and having an overall gearing toward making sure that we hire more people that are able to do this technological work, hire more people that are willing to help do customer service and do the little nitpicking things that take longer to make sure that all our communities are running as fast as possible. And it's not something our leaders are new to asking for. They've been asking for this. So we definitely need to actually move forward and move in advance to working and, in, and investing in all parts of our communities, not just the shiny ones that tourists go to. Right, right. And Diana? Yeah, absolutely. Everything Tatiana said. Um, Katie, I'm, I'm so glad this is the first question because I, I actually highlighted like the dessert without the main dish was my favorite line in the whole segment. That's such a good, such a good example of, of what we're talking about. Communities know what they need. You know, like we don't need politicians to tell us like, you know, I run into this a lot as a queer person. Like, I can actually just tell you what I need as a queer person and like people who live in East Tampa can tell you what they need in East Tampa. Um, and this point was really driven home. Like we, Dream Defenders was actually canvassing yesterday in East Tampa to raise awareness about House Bill 1. And the other question we asked was like, what's the number one issue in your community? What do you see needing to happen in your community? And no one's at a rec center, <laughs> you know, people, and, but people had answers. Like no one needed to think about it. Like people were like, like, you know, people had like their answers on the ready and it was not the stuff that we've been seeing come up in city council over and over. Um, so yeah, it's just very interesting to me that you can be talking to people in a community for one hour and you will come away with a pretty significant understanding of what the people in the community need. And they just completely failed to do that um, with these priorities. You know, right. It's so like, well. I understand you need this, but here's a rec center. <laughs> All right, here's a refers rec center. Um, so that's going to move on to actually the war on drugs segment. So again, for those who didn't watch, um, item 41 was the adoption of the ordinance called the Tampa Com Comprehensive Plan, which pertains to land usage. So city council voted to adopt the provision uh, to include modifying police language directing uh, the Tampa Police Department to focus on neighborhood crime and drug activity. So I just wanted to know, how do you feel this new provision will affect the community? And we can start with you, Diana. Yeah, I mean, the war on drugs is such a well-chronicled attack on Black and brown people. Like, that's just not a controversial statement at all. It's proven over and over again. And it's, and even in Tampa, like, State Attorney Andrew Warren passed, like, a, whatever, he did a resolution a couple of years ago to say he doesn't prosecute low-level marijuana possession. Like, we are moving, you know, we could be moving in the right direction on this. And so this, to me, is such a regression. Like, we were kind of getting there in Hillsborough. We were understanding maybe, like, tough on crime policing and, like, the war on drugs is less popular of an issue than it was. So this is really disappointing to see um, this kind of backsliding. We just know better. Like, there's no excuse at this point. This is not, you know, there's absolutely no excuse to be continuing to prosecute drugs. And we, we have so many alternatives like needle exchanges, you know, that were mentioned in the video. 
Um, this is definitely, definitely not the way to do it, but there's money in it. There's money in police, like doing raids on drug houses and things like that. So yeah, very disappointed in that. And Tatiana? Yeah, no, to me, I completely agree with everything Diana said. To me, it's just, it's using the same systems that we've used over and over and over again and seeing the same result, which is people, which is there are poverty in these communities. There's crime in these communities and people fall into them because they don't actually have structural support and community resources because what police do and come into these communities is torment and terrorize these people. So they're not going to end up in good places. They're not going to have good outcomes when they are constantly being terrorized instead of actually having money invested in the communities to feed people, to keep them off the streets, to keep them in their homes and especially safe during a pandemic. The fact that people are having to leave their homes and there's so much crime increasing during a pandemic shows that people are truly struggling. I saw a statistic that 40% of Floridians were on the edge of being evicted from their homes. And there's actually no clear tracker in Hillsborough to see who is being the numbers of people that are still being evicted. So we don't exactly know how many people are being kicked out of their homes at this current moment to tr to like to actually help them and instead we're having more people on the streets we're having more crime more violence instead of actually giving money into the communities as the communities have requested over and over again and not just charging people over and over again for low level crimes and saying oh these are good people they just don't have other outcomes and other circumstances to help them through it and so i just think all this money all this time being diverted to East Tampa isn't actually being diverted to resources that will help the community empower itself and create new forms of justice like restorative justice, like abolition that would help people actually grow out of these situations and be able to empower themselves out of these situations that cause crime. Instead of just focusing on, oh, there are more shootings, we should just send more cops. And we know that over-policing does not help. It does not improve the community and it does not solve the problem we need. So we need to go toward the solutions that we know, which is overall more decriminalization of low-level drugs, overall less prosecution. And right now we should be actually talking about removing everyone that's on that's in jail that could be easily taken out because their trials haven't even started yet because they've been postponed because of Zoom because of the pandemic. We have people being held for longer periods because of the circumstances we're in, instead of just sending them home and then calling them back in. So I just think there's there we're doing we're we're going backwards. We're not actually solving the problems that the community is saying we need to solve. And the community is bringing solutions. The community is constantly bringing solutions, but they're going with the systems that will fund them and continue the cycles of violence over and over again. Right, and I totally agree. And funny you mentioned cycle of violence as we move into our next segment. Uh, the liquor stores in East Tampa. So um, item 47 basically spoke about whether or not to approve a liquor license for a package store on 4808 East Broadway Avenue. Now a liquor store is also called a package store because the pre-packaged alcoholic beverages that are sold. Now Dean Felder and, or Councilman Dean Felder and Councilman Goose voted no, but all other council members voted yes. Uh, specifically, Vieira and Citro both gave testaments to the ne negative impacts of package stores, yet they still voted yes. So if you, I just didn't understand how they understood the negative impacts of the package stores, yet they voted in favor of the package stores. So clearly evident, evident city council members understand the negative impacts of package stores, yet voted to approve another one. This is just another example of how city council understands the needs of the community, yet they don't vote in favor of their constituents. What are your thoughts on yet another package store in East Tampa and the way the city council voted? Yeah, so it is just like a lot of campaigns that have gone through and gone up to city council over and over again, where the community comes saying, hey, we have this issue. Would you create the solution to solve this issue? And they're like, we hear you, we see you. But then when it comes to the vote that would actually use their power to divert resources to create a better good, they decide we're going to vote with our interests. We're going to vote with our donors. We're going to vote with the people that fund us instead of voting with the constituents that are the people that put them into this position. And it really drives me crazy because it, it just shows how our leaders don't actually vote and stand up for the citizens that put them into power when the times get tough. Right now, we're in the toughest times we've ever imagined. And this is the time for our leaders to have bold and effective leadership to bring us into the future and not just stand up and say, I get it. I hear why you guys disagree with this, but I'm going to do something else. And I just think that's such a cowardice and shows like such lack of character in a time where we really are looking to these leaders that have a lot of power, have a lot of tools for effective change, and they completely disregard and ignore those 
when it's time to actually work with the community. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting and a, and a very complex issue. I definitely agree with the statement that was said in the segment about, you know, there's this upcoming meeting and, and there's really a time where we can flesh this out very deeply because, you know, there's these these really well documented problems with liquor stores where we also know that, you know, there's tons of public intoxication and loitering around alcohol establishments in South Tampa. And that just doesn't translate into high crime rates the way it does um, in communities that are over-policed. Florida tries to re-legislate alcohol like every year. You know, there was, a, I think it was last year where there was a bill about, um, you know how there's like Publix liquors and then there's like Publix and there's Walmart liquors and there's Walmart. And, and that's because there's a law that says like you can't sell liquor in the store. So then, you know, that law has kind of created actually all of these businesses, um, especially um, Ida Eskamani actually talked really brilliantly during uh, that, legis that piece of legislation about how like this has actually created a strong market for immigrants. Entrepreneurship is really hard in low income communities and for better, or for worse, probably for worse, like liquor stores are one of the places where you like have this entry into entrepreneurship that you can guarantee will be pretty successful because we also know low income communities like medicate with alcohol and drugs more often so i don't know i think that it's really important to have community input in this um and, and i really would you know hope that the the community comes out and kind of like talks as the community about about this issue and about this issue of like is liquor store something we want in our neighborhood you know how do we want to decide this and not and this be something bigger than just city council and like this majority white board deciding whether or not to give businesses in low-income communities licenses or not that they that they definitely readily give out in south tampa so i don't know i think it's it's a really big issue and i hope that you know the community is, is involved in the decision i love that point of the the other standpoint of like okay cool so we may do away with liquor stores in the in the neighborhoods but that also puts in a profit margin for larger corporations such as walmart Publix, to uh then put liquor stores all, along with their establishments that's already there so that's all I have for you all today. Is there any final thoughts that you all would like to say before we head out? If y'all want to get involved in stopping House Bill 1, uh, we're canvassing every Saturday uh, until the end of session. So it's a good way to get involved um, and, and be talking to communities like face to face and hearing their issues. It was a really good experience. Yeah, I just um, wanted to say that it's a really hard time. And I know a lot of people are really struggling and really trying to find themselves in all of this. And I just want to say there are a lot of people in the community, there are a lot of beautiful and effective leaders and members of all these organizations that are really trying to make our community the most beautiful and the most impactful place that it can possibly be. And if you're worried that, oh, it might not be for me, this organization might not be for me, there might be drama, lead with what you think can change, lead with that change you want to bring, because there are so many people that want to hear your opinion, that want to hear your stance, and want to see that same type of change happen in our communities. And I think on that same end, there are a lot of our community leaders that really need to hold themselves to the promises they made to their community. When they said they're going to listen, when they said they're going to vote, when they said they're going to represent minority communities, black and brown communities, they need to do that in the ways that won't impoverish, the ways that won't criminalize, the ways that won't punish communities for just existing. I also want to say that if you're also interested in running for these positions, if you're interested in really physically changing the layout that we see and the demographic we see in these positions, reach out to People's Safety Coalition, reach out to Tampa People's Protest. We're really right now trying to recruit people to come and learn about these positions so we can make our city council look a lot more like us, look like the people that want to change it, that want to make this the best place ever. Like right now, there's signs all over Tampa that say Champa for winning the Super Bowl. But what would make Tampa a great place is using the leadership and the people that are already here and the communities that are here and elevating the words and actually creating the resources that they need to move forward. Period. All right. <laughs> so uh, that's all we have today for this episode of Frontline Activist Message. Thank you all for tuning in and we're signing off. Have a good one.